All right, yeah. Sounds better. I just have to... Is that good? Drum gone? Yeah, the only, the only little bit that's off now is just a bit of uh, just latency or whatever. It's fine. Okay, good. Hi, welcome back. <laughs> How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Good. How was your week? Good, good. I see you're sitting on the ball again. Sitting on my ball. <laughs> <laughs> I should bring in a hard chair. Just It's just too tempting. I'd be doing the same. <laughs> when you're editing all day, it's a little nicer than the chair. No, I can't say I've ever sat on one, not that I can think of, but I don't it's know. It's pretty good. It takes a little getting used to, but it's not too bad. So I opened this up for everybody because I thought it would be interesting to meet some of you that maybe didn't join us for the conscious eating but um, are curious. You have questions. You want to ask who knows what. So fire away. Colin was here last time, last week, and so we had a good discussion about gardening, eating, food, you name it. So um, yeah, bring on your questions. And hi, welcome. It's the first time I've done this, so it's a little awkward. Awesome! It's the second time I've done it. No, I came to you through your brother, I guess. Thanks. So, no, I've been enjoying the videos. They're very ed educational. Wonderful. Are you a cook? Uh, try to be. <laughs> That's a yes in my My bed. girlfriend is a much better cook than I am. So you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Where are you? Where are you? In, where are you right now? Where are you calling in from? Uh, I'm from I'm from the east coast of Canada, but mm -hmm. uh, I just spent the last six years in New Orleans, and now I'm back in Ontario. Wonderful! I've got a couple Canadians here. I'm yeah, from Ontario too. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm in Burlington. <laughs> oh, I just live down there. Okay, it's a nice city. I've only been here since January. I lived there for about a year, I think. Okay. So are you joining us for the conscious eating? Is this the first time you've heard about it? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think I could handle 40 days of it. Only 30. <laughs> so what, what is your diet like now? Back what kind then. of stuff do you eat? Oh, I can fix it. Microphones, speakers. Colin, I know you have questions. <laughs> oh, all over the board. Actually, um, you said your girlfriend was coming over, the one from that uh, yeah. uh, yeah. one video. I called her for a minute. She did. That's she came it. over, and we actually yeah. know, but I have oh, the beehive footage that we need through, oh, so I need to get rid of that so I can upload the new stuff. But we did. We cooked, and we preserved lemons, and made a dish, so this will be up in a couple of days. Oh, excellent. She has very good uh, camera presence, so she wants to cook with me this summer. So I'm very she's, excited about that. She's the one that was in that video, right, that Cody did? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she seemed like a very uh, high-energy, kind of bubbly kind of person. She is. She's fantastic. And she she doesn't know, um, no, there's no barriers. She'll do anything. She'll try anything. She's just, she's delightful to be with. I'll look forward to that one. Yeah, and she's been fermenting food, naturally fermenting food. So she brought over a little vial of something. She's like, taste this. It was mildly alcoholic. It was <laughs> lightly sweet. It was, it was kind of like a kombucha, but a little bit better, but not as strong as like a wine. Like, what is that? And they were some pickled cherries that she and I had Ooh. preserved last summer. And um, she wasn't using them. We, we got lazy towards the end of the cherry season, and we just started pickling them with pits in them. Like, oh, we could just eat them, like, on a cheese tray and warm people. So she took them out of the refrigerator. They were in Mexico, and she let them sit out in the hot Mexican sun for two months, three months. And then she was brave enough to drain them and taste the liquid. It was fantastic. And so 
that's the kind of person she is. She just she just experiments wildly. Oh, that's neat. I wouldn't I wouldn't have the uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be brave enough to try something I've been sitting out for two months. Me either. <laughs> but I mean, when I worked with a food scientist last week, she and I were looking at this kind of formation on the top of these fermenting cashews, and it looked really gnarly. It was all brown. It looked like um, almost like frozen tundra that pushes up and then defrosts in the spring and it leaves all those cracks. Mm -hmm. And she's kind of scraping it off and we're looking at it and I'm like, I don't know, it doesn't smell terrible, but it looks crazy. And my other girlfriend wanted no part of it. <laughs> she's like, that's disgusting, throw it away. We're like, no, 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 there might be something knowledgeable. And so we're rooting through it. And I'm like, you know what, if people have that attitude like mine, to just throw it away, we wouldn't have cheese, we wouldn't have yogurt, we wouldn't have all these delicious things. So sometimes you just got to experiment for experiment's sake. Oh, experiment, as long as somebody <laughs> else goes first. <laughs> <laughs> well, and preserving is, is interesting because it goes against everything that we've ever been told. You can't leave food out, you don't let mm -hmm. it sit, you have to refrigerate things. But there's a point when you look at the history of recipes and the, like the evolution of American food, uh, European cuisine, pre-refrigerator, pre-ice box. You have recipes like chutneys and all of these acidic vinegary foods that now have vinegar or lemon in them, but at one time were probably fermented. So it's an interesting concept that we now, not very many years later, 100 years later, we're completely divorced from that notion of preserving food naturally and letting the bacteria preserve the food to a certain state. And now we're just like, if it gets left out, it's bad. We're afraid of it, unless yep. it's been preserved for us by the factory. <laughs> so it's just interesting to think about. Well, we, uh, we've gotten to the, the point where we rely on the refrigerators and uh... The grocery store is our pantry. Like, nobody knows anything anymore about preservation. That's why I'm trying to trying to find it again. Yeah. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. And there's a huge movement, at least in this part of the country. I'm on the West Coast, so there's this huge movement to learn these kind of lost arts of food and cultivation and preservation and becoming more energy efficient. So relying on your freezer or learning how to can, learning how to pickle, learning how to preserve. Well, that's a, that's a lot of the reason why I want to learn how to do it. I, I want to be able to save a lot of the stuff that I grow, but I'll be darned if I'm going to spend a, a fortune in energy just trying to throw it in the fridge or the, or the freezer. It's, it just seems kind of dumb. I'd, I'd love to try making a, a cold cellar. Just, I don't think I can do it where I am right now. Yeah. I don't even have a chest freezer. My freezer is like this big on the bottom of my refrigerator and people are like I can't believe you don't have a freezer and I just I struggle with that I would love to go pick peaches blueberries all of the things cherries pick them put them in bags and freeze them um, and I freeze what I can in my little space but it's like all year long this is just a huge energy suck for a little bit of stuff so I opened a can of pickled cherry tomatoes that Mo and I did last year, and they were fantastic, like perfectly whole, intact. We pickled them in vinegar with some spices. Um, instead of using like balsamic drizzled on a salad or even on a sandwich, like a few of these, you just get this little vinegary pop, and it's wonderful. Like, why don't people do this? That'd be worth a try this year. I had so many cherry tomatoes last year. Have you roasted them, slow roasted them in a pan in the oven? No, I've never done that either. Dude, <laughs> so good. They're, it's like my favorite tomato thing ever. You, just, you, you put them on the pan whole and just throw them in the oven? or? Yep, yep, like 425, 450. Um, no, not that high. I'm going to slow roast them. Let's do like three, start out with 350. For maybe 45 minutes to an hour, just depending. Like if you, the slower you roast them, the sweeter they'll be. Sometimes I rush it into them high roasting, um, just to get the moisture out. But it condenses the flavor, and then something magic happens to the sugar, and they turn into these little sweet, gooey 
I can't even tell you how good they are. Like, they barely make it into a dish. I just roast a pan and end up eating them all. <laughs> yeah, I'll be trying that. Yeah, they're yummy. That um, uh, ghee, I, I made that on the weekend. Holy, I can't stop sticking my nose in the jar. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, it's, it just smells like something you want to stick a spoon in and just eat. Caramelized butter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, I had uh, enough for one and a half of those uh, the small mason, uh, medium mason jars. So I filled the one up for myself, and I took the other half over to my mother's, and I said, oh, here, smell this, and tell me what you think it is. And she's... She didn't figure it out. Ah, yeah, it's it's a simple thing, but the transformation, just like most cooking, like it's the perfect alchemy of something magic, something plain, yeah. something magic. And it's really neat when you're heating it. It's almost like uh, someone flips flips a switch, and all the all the water's gone, and it, it goes from a, a bubbling to just kind of you can hear it. It just mm -hmm. stops making noise. Mm-hmm. So did yours turn out grainy or did it turn out smooth? Mine, it turned out smooth. Okay, so I've made it my whole life and it's been smooth. The last three times that I've made it, I've used a different brand of butter. And oh, it's yeah. been grainy and I'm like, oh, I ruined it. What did I do? Was it too hot? Did I cook it too long? So I did an internet search and there are these Indian women and they said that the grainy is preferred that it has, um, and this is a lot of a lot of, especially other countries where their food heritage and culture is so rich and deep. There's a lot of like folklore infused in it, and so they're like medicinally, it's so much better for you if it's grainy. And so they actually take a little bit of water at the very end, once it's completely rendered out, throw throw it in the hot liquid. The water will evaporate. But something with that cold water in contact creates those little crystals, and it granulates. So apparently it was desired. I thought it was not desirable because I'm like, ooh, this texture is weird, and it's all gritty. And so, that's, why, uh, that's why the picture of yours looked different. It looked like it had crystals on, on the edge or on the spoon or whatever. <laughs> and I I'm telling people how to do this, and I don't know what happened. And so, yeah, it's just it's just the brand of butter. That was the only consensus that I could come up with. So, and I've used the same brand the last three times. Yeah, see, I just went out and bought uh, just a normal, everyday, not a good quality one. I figured, okay, I'm gonna try this. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I didn't I didn't think to ask was, do you get the salted or unsalted? I'm assuming unsalted, but. You know, I go totally against the grain for most cooks. Most cooks say, especially bakers, bake without salt because the recipes are calibrated for unsalted butter. I don't like unsalted butter. So inevitably, I use the salted stuff, and then I have unsalted left in my fridge, and, and I'm making toast or something that is not baked good and I want salt on my butter, and then I have to salt it, then it tastes like salty and flat, and so I, I end up just buying salted butter and using it, and then just decreasing the salt content of my recipe slightly. But I also have a really high kind of um, salt tolerance. I love super salty foods, so do I. and I don't, my husband doesn't like food as salty as I do, so I have to be really careful, um, but I have super low, low, low blood pressure, and I don't know if that's related, but I feel like I need salt, like my body craves it. So yeah. a little extra salt is not is not a problem for me. Yeah, the stuff I got was salted as well, so I, d I didn't even know which one, but... Yeah. yeah. If it works, if it turns out, I figured out I'll get some good stuff then, but... Yeah. Did you try it on popcorn? No, I forgot to pick up some popcorn, <laughs> but uh, I will be. Because I'm really pouring good. it into the jar and I'm thinking, ah, oh, I forgot the popcorn. That was really bad to try this. You know, I've never tried it on toast, which is funny now that I think about it. So I don't know what it would taste like just melted out. I know that the, the salt comes out of it. So was yours salty at all? Um, I have to confess, I haven't actually made anything to try it with yet. Yeah. So it might be. Yeah, I just can't stop sniffing it. I'm thinking I should stick a wick in it and just burn it. Sniff it with <laughs> That's an expensive candle. <laughs> Cheaper than beeswax, though, I'll tell you that. 
after spending five days rendering beeswax, I'm like, man, I can see why it's eight bucks a pound, or at least, at least that's like what some of the lower prices. Uh, if you had a, if we had some warmer weather, you could do it with solar and just do it outside, but not easy yeah. this time of year. Yeah, it's still really cold. Where we were up in the mountains this morning, and it was. It was chilly. Hi, Chris. Oh my God! I, I got on here. I don't even do stuck out in the cold. I can't get him in. But we, I don't know how I did this, but this is a bloody miracle. Yay! So this is a different format than last week. I, when I set it up, I set it up through an event, and so I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Colin's got the long side of the story, so I set it up through an event. And when I logged on, I logged on like one of you guys. And so uh -huh. I didn't have any moderator controls. I didn't have the ability to tape it or broadcast it because I had went kind of in the back door. It worked, but other people were having problems with it. So this Yeah, I couldn't worked. get on with like my administrator permission. And really, I don't even know what I was pushing or what I was doing to get here to see. I was watching y'all. Me and Dew were in the other room going, we can't get in. We're like two puppy dogs looking in the window. And I'm hearing y'all talk. It's kind of like being a voyeurist. Uh-oh, I just lost you. Where'd you go? No, I'm here. Oh, I just see blueberries with a big P, but okay. Oh, uh, Prana Anderson, somebody else came in. Nice, welcome. So what's up? How was your week? Me? Yeah. Ah, uh, loaded question, but okay. I mean, I'm making way, and um, <laughs> I'm making way. It's like one day at a time, but it's okay. Good. Oh, there you are. Now there's that pretty girl. And then I see, I see, I uh, see, I see like five people in here. Four yeah. Three? Tony, Pete, Branderson, Paul, and L. And C. Hi. So, are, is everybody else muted, and we're just talking? I think so. Well, Colin, Colin, and I were chatting, and then the others I haven't heard from them yet. So, make yourself be known. Say hi. And so, do I be quiet so someone else can talk? Is that how that works? Oh, or see, now you, can, you can talk, and other people can listen. Pretty much everyone can talk at once. It just uh, gets a little confusing. Oh, there you are. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. It is fun. So, Colin, you made the spaghetti sauce. Uh, yeah, I ate it for three days straight because I couldn't stop eating it. <laughs> Just on pasta, or did you get experiment with it? Didn't make it past the pasta. <laughs> I think I ate two full boxes, of, at least two full boxes of pasta. It's, that's that's the best spaghetti sauce I've ever had in my life. The, the downside is I used the last of my canned tomatoes, so I'll be waiting a bit before I can make more. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that uh, that coconut... Uh, <laughs> uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was something else. You would have been, uh, you would have been laughing if, you saw, if there was a video on that. Um, <laughs> You gotta give us a brief, a brief, um, give everybody a, a brief scenario of what happened with your coconut this week. Well, uh, she puts up this video on how to make uh, coconut, was it coconut milk? Coconut butter. Coconut mm. butter, that's what it was. And she said you gotta, you gotta use the, the, or you should use the big coconut flakes, but you can use the, the shredded coconut if need be. It just won't be as, as creamy. Well, I'm thinking, well, I can't find the flakes. Um, uh, next best thing is full coconuts, so I bought a couple of coconuts and I drained them out and, uh, cracked the shell and then peeled them all to get the brown stuff off. And, uh, about an hour later, I threw it all into the, uh, food processor and started it up and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't doing too well. It was, uh, wasn't looking a darn thing like Corinne's. And, uh, so I figured, well... It's really dry. I'll add the water back in from the coconut, and that uh, kind of helped a little bit. It's still pretty dry, so I had some coconut milk in the fridge. So I figured, oh, I'll throw that in too. What could it do? Yeah, it didn't turn out. It uh, it turned out actually uh, kind of like a moose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 
I, I'm not sure what I invented, but I don't think it was good. <laughs> Did it taste good? It couldn't have been bad. No, well, I've been using it in the uh, uh, in the muesli, yeah. and I uh, used some in the uh, the smoothie as well. Perfect. In the fridge, needless to say. <laughs> and getting coconut out of the shell, fresh coconut, is not an easy task. And then my hammer is still on the counter. <laughs> so I'll teach you a little tiny, bit. tiny little pieces, and then uh, you got that paper-like stuff on them. I'm like, well, I don't want to throw that in there; it's going to wreck it. So uh, I'll take a knife, I'll peel it off. No big deal. Is this going to be really good? No. That's no. fantastic. <laughs> so fresh coconuts. If you take them with like the, I always think of them as like a bowling ball with the three little eyes at the top. If you just take a really big knife, I've got like a nine inch kitchen knife, and you hit it around the horizon line, right around the middle, and you just keep hitting it as you turn it, it'll crack into two perfect halves. Uh, the second one I did, I actually got a quarter of it off. That's a start. <laughs> That's uh, better than a little sharp. But you, you can't really get big chunks of the shell off the meat. You end up with a whole bunch of little pieces. And it's, uh, you'd freak out if you saw what I was doing with the knife, so. <laughs> Actually, I probably wouldn't, but the safety sallies would. Yeah, well, <laughs> they have no business in my house. <laughs> I'm the one that gives knives to little kids and like, okay, chop that. <laughs> and their moms are like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like, what, they're six? They can figure it out? Yeah, what could happen? <laughs> oh. So, any questions this week? What's going on food-wise? Well, I've been eating a lot better. I'm not going to say I've been perfect, but uh, it's a good start. I've been having the, the muesli, uh, with the exception of this morning, every morning since I started making it on the weekend. i got to make some tonight, but uh, i got to do dishes before I can make it. <laughs> yeah, I don't cook in a dirty kitchen either. No. So, what, what flavors are you doing? Um, I haven't done too much. Uh, the, just the the base, and then I, uh, the first batch I did was just raisins, and the second batch I did was raisins, and uh, I found some dried um, oh, what the heck's it called? It's a fruit, mango. There we go. Mm -hmm. So I sliced up some of that really thin and threw it in. Uh, Instead of using honey, I've used uh, real maple syrup, not that table syrup, the real stuff. The good stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's plenty sweet with just a little squirt of maple syrup. Don't need anything extra in there. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, I probably put three or four times what you did for cinnamon. I love cinnamon. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mix it in when I make it, and then I dump a whole bunch more on top um, when I'm about to eat it, and chop up a banana and throw it in, too. Yum! It is nice to have something that's healthy, that's whole, that's good, that you don't have to cook in the morning. Well, the nice thing is I've never done breakfast in the morning. I'm, I'm not hungry when I first wake up. Mm -hmm. And I wake up, I just kind of wake up and go. Um, so it's great. I just grab it out of the fridge and I still go. And then, you know, half an hour, an hour later when I'm at work and I am hungry, then I'll... Uh, I have it. It's been great. Okay. Yeah, it's nice. Breakfast is important because it wakes up our whole digestion. So when we're sleeping, we go into like this kind of low metabolic state because um, we're not eating. And so if you don't eat in the morning, even like waking up and just drinking a really nice, like big kind of warm-ish glass of water just helps to kind of wake your body up and get your digestion going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just something with, it's been that way ever since I was a kid, I wake up, I'm not hungry. Yeah. The, thought of, the thought of food first thing in the morning, just, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> I think more than anything, it's just habit. You've gotten used to not eating, so your body's like, mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of it too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, are you I'm, a breakfast eater? You know, it's, it's a... Uh, Typically, no, I'm not, and I and that's more mental than and it that's is. More mental than it is. Um, I think um, I get 
if I, when I eat I breakfast in the morning, I find I'm super hungry by lunch because I I'm physiologically realize that my uh, metabolic system is sped up, and then uh, it's a little more difficult for me. You know, it's different. I just get super hungry because things are actually functioning. So I typically will have coffee in the morning, uh, get to the office, but I will have maybe a mid-morning uh, breakfast but lunch type of a thing, and it's fairly, uh, I guess, same thing. It's it's a big thing of Greek yogurt with uh, some nuts and dried fruit and grape nuts and some coconut soy milk. And that, it's like the pure protein power punch. And that really uh, sustains me for several hours. And I can, I feel pretty good and can think straight and, uh, and can carry on through the day till about four. So I'm not like your standard three meal a day woman. It's like, I kind of go with when I'm hungry, then I'll respond to that rather than respond to what the clock's telling me, I suppose. That's fantastic. I mean, my ideal is to wake up with tea or maybe have like a half an avocado and then eat a meal at like noon or 11 and then another small meal at like 4. Right. I don't like dinner. Yeah, dinner dinner can be dangerous for me personally. Yeah. Um, so I – and sometimes it's, it's dinner on purpose to be dangerous. It just depends on where my head's at, but that's my thing. Right. Um, but if I'm being super careful and conscious and uh, actually applying, taking care of myself, um, then it's it's really an earlier dinner so that I feel okay um, by the time I go to bed. And then uh, typically when I do it right, then I wake up, you know, have my coffee, and then I'm hungry earlier, and I'm and I'm on a good roll. But it's so for me, only speaking for me, it's so easy for me to get on a bad roll and then it's super hard to get back on track for me. It's just so habitually addictive to feel uh, I function because I'm so used to it being hungry and it's just almost the norm yeah. for me. And um, so when I feel satiated or full and energetic, that for me, <laughs> again, is foreign and actually can really mess with my mind, but again, I keep saying for me because I, you know, I come from a long lineage of eating disorder, and working around that is purely mental for me more than it is physiologically. Right, and for those of you that are on, Chris is a friend of mine, and um, I was bulimic and anorexic for about 20 years, so I haven't said that publicly on my site, and it's nothing that I'm ashamed of or nothing that I avoid. Um, what it was is I can identify so with what you say because you get a physical rush from being hungry. Mm -hmm. um, and when you feel sated and when you feel full, there's this feeling of panic. And so I would just function not eating or eating and immediately throwing up food and so that I was hungry again because that is how I operated under mm -hmm. like it's like an adrenaline surge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so for me to be so food obsessed as a young person in such an unhealthy way in such a control way and which is actually a lack of control but we feel like it's a sense of control um, and to take that that directive food consciousness and move it into something that's healthy and productive. Mm -hmm. So as somebody that studied psychology and especially addiction, you don't get rid of behaviors. You don't rid yourself of that addictive type of rush. You just replace it. Mm -hmm. So replacing it with choices that you know honor your body and nourish your body, which is also your mind, your well-being, your connectivity to other people, like mm -hmm. all of that is so interrelated. And so food, I have a very interesting relationship with food, and, and you noticed it um, from watching my channel. So Chris and I live near each other, and she, we kind of found each other through food. 
ironically. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not ironic. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. And for me, it's all about that that self love. I'm not used to giving that to myself. So and and then feeling deserving and worthy, and it's all interrelated to self worth and existing and feeling worthy enough to walk the face of the earth and take up space. I'm not a very big person and that's not you know that's by design I'm probably if I I don't even know what normal is for Chris Kendall because I've been suffering with an eating disorder you know since I was 14 and I'm 47 and it's that's a long ass time oh my gosh but it you know it's been worse it's been better it's been managed it's been not managed it's been treatment centers and all this addictive thing um, I've been in recovery for alcohol for 11 years. That's a no-brainer. Like all day long, I could do that. Yeah. Just remove the alcohol, not a problem. But with food, I gotta fig, I gotta figure that one out. And so it's definitely a one day at a time deal for me. And sometimes I'm really lost, you know. And and uh, anyway, I'm just letting it hang out there. All right, Corinne. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. So tell me, what is conscious eating to you? What does that mean? Conscious eating is uh, I can just what popped in my brain is self love and actually giving that gift to myself because I know what to do. I have a minor in nutrition. I have psychology background. I could counsel you all day long on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't know how to do a coconut per se, but <laughs> the other stuff I get. But it's all about what is it Chris deserves and conscious eating for me is making a conscious choice to take care of Chris so that I do feel better so that I can be a good mom and a good whatever in my job and um, and when I'm not feeling good I know exactly what to do to punish to punish myself and to be in that starvation mode and operating on fumes and being orthostatic and because that is the norm for Chris right. so it's a real leap and it's needing that a lot of reassurance about you're okay you can do this and um, I have a hard time giving that to myself and I'm not walking around going I just ate a la 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 you want to pat my back and tell me it's going to be okay I mean that's not not normal yeah you know but you get that yeah. and maybe other people in the group get sort of that um, but it's the food issue I'd far better you know give birth to 10 babies than get you know no drugs nothing just do it and then deal with this animal because it's really it's it's a it's insidious with me and it's almost like who I am but I don't want it to be who I am right so if you identify you know, with it when it's it's been your your life it's been yeah. your reality for most of your life mm -hmm. yeah and it's refreshing when I find someone that I don't have to explain all that much and you get it I really don't have to go that far and you already know Mm -hmm. um, there aren't a lot of people who are public about their issues with food, however, it's everywhere. Well, and it's interesting because there are certain socially acceptable food um, issues. issues and then others that aren't. And no. anorexia definitely falls on the socially acceptable because that's what we see on the runway. That's our experience of billboards of women and advertising is this malnourished, right. very very, very abnormally thin woman. Right. So, and then on the other extreme of food issues is obesity and people that cannot control their eating but don't have the power. Same mechanism, they just don't have the power and it's a different approach to that relationship with food. And it, it's the same thing, the underlying lack of self-love. Or the bulimia where it's all secret, you may present yourself as thin and then but not socially acceptable that you know have coffee and say oh by the way I you know threw up over a porcelain throne all, all night for six hours last night what'd you do you know that's just people's head spin when you go there you right. know they don't get it it's because it's it's awful it's awful you know but to me it's just it, it's not you know I don't recoil from that because I get it yeah you know? So, and I don't judge people for having no, some people who are obese have tremendous control and they eat nothing, mm -hmm. uh, but yet their metabolism is so off kilter with thyroid or whatever and they're obese and it, 
I can't even imagine what, what that would feel like. That would be a huge empathy for living that way and having that judgment all day long because of your physique. I mean, I just have such compassion for people like that. Right. Um, we all have, I mean, food's just a mystery to me and a relationship over anything, you know, and I knew if I removed that relationship that my relationships with friends, yeah, my daughter, with people would be so much more intimate. With thyroid or whatever, and they're obese. Oops, are you there? I don't know. There you are. Okay. So you two that just joined, you guys have your browsers open, so we're getting feedback. So I went ahead and muted your mics. So if you could just close your browser down and just leave this video screen up, then we won't have the reverb in the background. Am I doing it right? You know what I'm doing? No. <laughs> Sound like a tech year ready. <laughs> Hi, old man Grub. Hi, old man Grub. G'day, how you going? Good, how are you? Good, how are you? Not too bad. You've got your, you've got, got me open, open on another browser. Another I, can, browser yeah. I can hear my voice from your voice from Oh, oh, wait on. Just give me a second. It was a hassle getting here in the first place. <laughs> and, oh, perfect. I'm glad you're here. What time is it for you? Um, it is 10, 10.48 in the morning, on Thursday morning. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you, where old are man? You? Are you in Australia or in New England? Where? where? Uh, in, in Australia, in Queensland. Cool. I think you got your mic a little too close to your speakers there, bud. Yeah, I'm off the laptop, so it's all it's playing up something bad today. I have to bump have off. To bump My daughter off. just got home, but I'll try and come back. Thank you for coming. Thank you for You're coming. welcome. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye, 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 Chris. Bye. 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 So Chris brings so up a really brings up point about our relationship. And what I've learned over the course of my life in, in studying psychology so that I could understand eating disorders, so that I could understand addiction, um, it's our relationship with food is like a window into our relationship with ourselves. So it's really interesting to have people react to something that you need to do on a daily basis in such a disordered ways. But it's really representative of the disorder that we feel and whether that's disconnect from our bodies, disconnect from our communities, disconnect from our loved ones. A lot of times those those issues are, they manifest in food and our relationships with them. So it's very interesting for me because when I started cooking, I was wildly um, ill at the time and I didn't eat. So I was cooking for other people. And so for maybe 20 years, I was a feeder <laughs> and a food pusher. And so I wouldn't physically eat but I wanted love in a way that that was my way of giving to other people, bringing people in, bringing people together, although I didn't quite know how to put the pieces together and actually build those relationships. So it's, it's very dear into my heart. I've seen Chris around town, and I wanted to reach out to her, and I see her in yoga. And it wasn't until I started making food videos that she actually contacted me. Um, so kind of an interesting thing, but I have a tremendous amount of empathy for people that struggle with food and that haven't defined a healthy relationship with it. What next? <laughs> 